and tell us all about the National Forum. delighted to have today for our first seminar here at IT Carlo, um, Dr. John Wilson, who's come all the way from Australia. And John is going to lead a very interactive session today. Initially, we'll have, uh, he will speak with to us and then he'll get us down to work very hard. So his, his air, he, he's going to talk about the MELT, which are models of engaging learning and teaching and they're both it's both combined an elegance and also practicality john is senior lecturer at school of education in the university of adelaide and he's involved in both undergraduate and postgraduate teaching and learning john i'm going to hand the session over to you now great thanks very much dina and i was fascinated to see your entry um uh, visual presentation the video because I think um, the research that I know is that um, Ireland has the, the world's slowest crosses of pedestrian crossings. So they have to set the, the green man to be on longer uh, on average than around the rest of the world. And I was fascinated that the actual Ireland, Ireland must be populated by very fast readers because I was really having trouble keeping up with uh, the kind of the reading component of that. So um, it was, thanks for the introduction and the welcome. And it's uh, absolutely fantastic to see um, the colleagues here. As Dina said, I think uh, we're after a quality crowd and um, the actual size is uh, nowhere near as important as uh, the fact that you are here with us now. And uh, so I think we'll have a, a very good time together. So I'm going to pull up my PowerPoint slide and I'll check with Dina. Um, can you see the front um, title slide? Yep, I can. Good, okay. Excellent. And um, so now, Dina, I did notice that the recording had started and then stopped. So I just thought I'd mention, in case you, I know you want to record the session, just to make sure that everything's going okay for that one. Okay. Uh, yep, that, that's course. okay. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, beautiful. So thanks for coming to uh, this uh, first seminar series for your national forum and it's on the models of engaged learning and teaching. Now, if you think uh, we've got these challenges in higher education, and they are often broadly around engagement and learning. And I'm gonna just uh, mention uh, two challenges by introduction. So the first challenge is, is this one. Um, when I went to Ireland, um, the last time, the first time too, was 2009. And I was um, did some um, collaborative work with Trinity College Dublin. So I'm not sure if anyone here today is uh, from um, Trinity College, but uh, fantastic time. But I had weekends to go and travel, and I was just astonished. I didn't know anything about Newgrange, and it was just so beautiful, and I was so enwrapped um, to find this ancient architecture, and you know what. Five, over 5,000 years old in the Neolithic period. And what I was really fascinated by was the message, the architectural message. Now, all we can do is actually read, read the architecture. There's kind of no writing from the period. And it's obviously, it's open to interpretation. But for this um, 
seminar, what's important is that I was heavily engaged and I was fascinated to hear about the different possible philosophies that were going on. And that's one of the challenges for higher education is that we know that in our um, in courses and in um, whatever provision of learning we're engaging in, some students are very interested, very engaged in that sort of thing, but many are not. Many are not so heavily, say, invested as we are. And this, this particular example in Ireland was one where I just became spontaneously and naturally very fascinated, invested, heavily engaged. But we've got so many competitions for engagement. Um, you know, we've got the, just the fact that if, do I really want to engage with this course or this subject or this, um, this seminar right now? Um, why am I here? Like, do I forced by my parents or am I forced by my head of school or head of department? Um, and, and then we've got the competition with uh, social media and the way focus is being diverted um, to much more um, social, uh, socially orientated platforms um, that's taking students' time and attention away. So um, there's that sort of challenge. And then the second sort of challenge to move to the Australian context is uh, something where the world is on fire. Uh, we've got big problems. Now, um, this is the, the summer um, ending uh, in 2019, 2020 for Australia, but it's really in the year after that, that so much of the world has been on fire. Um, and so what was r ridiculous, um, extremely turbulent, um, you know, traumatic events in Australia has now been replicated in, in many places around the world since then. And uh, these were extreme even for Australia uh, at the time. But this is just emblematic of we need our graduates from our universities to have the skill set to deal with our current world. And, and the emerging problems. And they need to be engaged in learning. They need to pick up all they can, all the knowledge base, sure, the, the raft of skills, the attitudes um, that are emblematic of their, the work that they need to do um, from the uh, you know, early, mid, late 20, uh, 2020s and onwards to become the leaders. So if they're not engaged in learning now, what, um, what are they going to be doing when they're kind of leading um, in Ireland, in Australia, um, around the world? So there's two massive imperatives for us to think about engagement in learning today. So by the time you finish with the seminar, and hopefully you can stay for the workshop, but it'd be great if you have a really heightened awareness of factors that engage students in learning that you can um, collaboratively create your own model of engaged learning and teaching, and a, a deeper understanding of the melt and critique it and um, not take it as it is, but really um, have a, a deeper and fundamental sense because you uh, can challenge it. So this 50 minute seminar will introduce the melt and explore its key facets. We will have some liberty in it, but we'll um, set, really set the scene for the workshop for the following 90 minutes. And when you kind of work together, and we'll probably work in uh, two groups, I think. Uh, so we'll split 50-50. Uh, and um, you'll be working together on uh, your own, uh, a version for someone's context. So that's where we get going. So let's start at the end. What I think we all want is uh, not, it's not actually, our end goal isn't engaged learners, it's uh, engaged citizens who are competent, well-versed, uh, compassionate, um, so they're able to engage in the 21st century, in the, the digital age, in the um, age of the geopolitics and the environmental concerns, in so many different aspects. And what I thought you, I'll show you um, a graduate 
one year after they finished, in this case, the Bachelor of Oral Health, we uh, interviewed a number of graduates a year after the explicit use of one of the models of milk. Um, the initial uh, version was called Research Sure Development. That was the term that um, the Bachelor of Oral Health was using. Uh, so we used the term research skills with their students. And I actually thought that might end up being quite clunky when we're doing interviews because they're just going uh, into their um, dent dental clinics often, working with patients, not necessarily using the R word very much, um, but certainly engaging with people uh, and in, in, no doubt ongoing uh, engaged learning in, in that context. But um, when we started to interview the graduates, we did see some astonishing raft of skills that they were often quite comfortable use the, the research word, but a, and a broad range of things that are associated with uh, clinical reasoning, um, more broadly with patient care, including being well versed on um, contemporary treatments. So what I'm going to show you is one graduate's um, commentary on their explicit um, development and use and assessment of these um, these engaged learning skills, these research skills. And I'll read it to you if you don't mind. Um, there's a bit of text, but I'm just going to emphasize things as I go. So this graduate said, one year later, so I guess the main thing is to persevere and just keep going, not to get disillusioned and frustrated. It's hard, but it's well worth it. It's the best thing I've ever done. I love it. It's not only just work and looking up things and researching work things, it's my life. I've changed the way I think about a lot of things, politics, science, environment things. I think friends and family have commented that I've become a lot more of an interesting person. Yes, I can talk to anyone now. My whole personality has changed. So just embrace it and enjoy it. At the end of the three years, you'll look back and go, wow, I did it, I made it, I'm a new person. Yes, it's good, it's the best thing. Now, that might be a little bit of an extreme version of someone who's heavily engaged both in the degree and then in their working context and looking back and appreciating all that they picked up during the degree and that it was hard and it was, it was quite possible to be disillusioned and frustrated by university assignments and how did this relate to the clinical context I'm going to work in? It's hard, but um, they become um, um, empowered by this raft of skills associated with researching, clinical uh, reasoning in their case, critical thinking. And so even though this is a bit of an extreme version, it's this sort of story that we'd love to hear from our graduates and we'd even like to hear it from our students as they go. And can they appreciate just how much that they're learning or do they have to wait until they look back to realise how far they've come? So if we're thinking about engaged learning, then what does that actually mean? Well, just, I don't want to get into, um, you know, there's a lot of talk about um, student engagement. For a while, it's, it's um, the word engagement and engage and engaging are very risk uh, orientated words in that they risk becoming very glib, like many words do if they're overused. And I think uh, in Australia, and I wouldn't be surprised if in Ireland too, and engage and engagement uh, may be overused, but it doesn't mean they're not very helpful words. So my translation for you in a very um, simple, I think sometimes powerful way, is to think of it like this. Students that are frequently socially interactive and always minds on. Their engagement in learning, yes, definitely involves their mind and it involves, and the mind isn't just a cognitive device. Um, but there are many times where there's social interaction so that uh, students working together with students and sniffing out things together, um, students working obviously with um, Academics and professional staff who teach, uh, as the Carlo, uh, sorry, as the um, uh, the National Forum video said, uh, the professional development of those who teach, which are a really nice phrase, um, because we're interested in um, those who facilitate learning. However, they do that, 
And so we definitely want this um, socially interactive, but always minds on. And then we also want engaged teaching because um, we're learning institutions who employ people for teaching. Um, and there's a raft of different responsibilities from academics to casual staff to librarians to those who engage with students in quite diverse and different ways. I'm not always thought of directly as teaching, but often is a strong teaching component, like lab technicians engaging with students in laboratories, for example. So we want engaged teachers. And often teaching requires us to, to think about um, creatively constructing environments that have a really um, positive influence on, on students and to frame the preconditions for learning, you could say, um, often requires a lot of scholarly work and time and thoughtfulness, care, planning. And then there's the in the moment um, work when there's the direct teaching, whether online, face-to-face, -face, blended, whether literature-based, lab-based, uh, clinic-based, all these things require um, in situ uh, engaged teaching. And then there's also the things that happen outside of both of those contexts where things have started and there's assessment and there's, and there's a need for feedback and can feedback because of quality teaching um, dynamically inform students of how to proceed subsequently into their, their uh, the future learning tasks the feedback doesn't just stop still and say this is the feedback comments but it's actually part of a whole dynamic feedback loop which is really a massive part of teaching and engaged teaching so are there formulas for engaging well we could ask um, Carlos and Dana they're well, I call them twins but they're actually two of they're octuplet two of, oct of eight uh, same litter um, and I'm guessing the same day, definitely the same month. Most of them look like Carlos. Um, Dana was a bit of an odd one out. But these two dogs, if you look at them, they've got this a, a massive capacity for gazing into people's eyes. But actually, the way they engage people is incredibly different. So Dana on the right actually does this all the time. She's frequently just stares into your eyes and she almost hypnotizes people. <laughs> now, you might notice that there's a few differences. They don't look exactly identical. I don't know, can you spot the difference? But not only are they physically very, very different, but they're psychologically, behaviorally, um, in so many ways, very different. So Carlos rarely stares you in the eyes. He, I caught him for this photo. But he's much more likely to jump up and touch people and to uh, like be that like, overly um, expressive sort of in your face um, sort of cuddle you or even scratch you accidentally sort of dog. So they've got very different ways of uh, engaging um, with, with people. Um, and I think we're not going to provide a formula for engagement today. So we're going to talk about these models of engaged learning and teaching. But just like Carlos and Dana, being quite related, have different ways of doing that. I think um, there's a lot of personality, there's a lot of life, and um, the need for a connection, a relationship um, with students. But we're going to share these um, the parameters of these models of engaged learning and teaching, because there's also some things that we can learn together and share, and um, not be locked into a box with, but be uh, informed by, and uh, Think about that. So you could regard these models of engaged learning and teaching, or I'll call them MELT for short, if you don't mind, as a provocation, as a starting point to think about how do I promote engaged learning and how can I be an engaged teacher? How can I um, encourage other colleagues to be um, increasingly engaged? Um, how can we uh, join in together? Um, uh, into the enterprise. So one colleague we interviewed uh, in the context of medical science said, 
I see the framework being what I'll call nebulous enough for everyone to be able to accommodate it because it's not very prescriptive. Yes, it's a framework and everyone can work within a framework that is relatively comprehensive in what it describes overall. And I thought this is a really nice uh, insight into someone who'd been using the framework uh, for a little while at that time, that um, there's this tension between it's nebulous enough, but it is a framework. And so there's, there are parameters, but they're fluid, they're flexible. And it took a while before we came up with uh, the, the overarching name of model of engaged learning and teaching, but the, uh, the verb of MELT, the acronym connotes, has that beautiful sense of fluidity that um, very helpful for uh, the overarching concept. So you could say, um, where does the MELT come from? Well, the MELT um, the models of engaged learning and teaching are really a confluence. They're a meeting of two streams. Um, and where those two streams meet together, they fl flow on into uh, one river. So the milk are a little bit like that. So um, one stream, you've got facets of sophisticated thinking. This is what we're we doing in our brains. And they're informed by information literacy standards um, from Australia, but which are all influenced by US, which are influenced by, it goes back and back and back. Bloom's taxonomy, kind of the ancient version or the more modern versions. And there's a few different types of Bloom's taxonomies, which I won't quite go into today unless people were really interested. Um, there's another taxonomy solo, which is all about um, the degree of integration and synthesis of ideas, we could say. And then the framework that um, we originally developed from those things and other um, uses was the Research School Development Framework. Uh, we began using um, back in 2005, published in 2007. But these things were all influential on the, the facets of thinking, which I'll outline in a little bit of detail and I'll get you to engage with and do something with um, in about 10 minutes time. Then the other stream uh, is all around learning autonomy and how much structure and guidance do students have. Um, and these things are informed by those of you who know of um, the Russian psycho psych psychologist Vykotsky and his zone of proximal development, um, uh, uh, Dewey, uh, from the US and his learning through inquiry. Uh, David Boot and Australians uh, learning autonomy. And the, the research we did over, um, well, really from 2005 until 2020, all influenced our understanding of uh, learning autonomy. And so these things, um, the facets of thinking are really um, a version of what, what, we're, what our sophisticated thinking is and looks like. Uh, the what frequently in uh, university and school is often thinking about content, the subject content, that's the what. Um, and that's fine. There's, in fact, this sophisticated thinking is best developed in content rich contexts. So don't think so much about a generalized facetting, although I'm going to provide a general uh, look at it but really they're best developed in uh, the, the disciplinary and subject contexts uh, that demand their use. So the other stream is the how, how are these things going to be developed? How can they be facilitated and scaffolded? You could say, how much structured guidance, as I said? Um, and that answer is not a, a, um, a closed answer, it's very open. In fact, and it will remain open because there's, there's, there is no one answer. There's not, I think, a sweet spot. There's not like, well, obviously, highly prescribed early and then open-ended or very prescribed all the way through so students know exactly the standard they should meet. There's no, there's no, there's no one answer. But we'll look at the, um, the conversations, uh, thinking about learning autonomy on Earth. So these things, um, the confluence, of the what and then how, uh, you could say, comprise the models of engaged learning and teaching. So the, the MELT 
are not meant to be a new idea. <laughs> uh, you can see a lot of the references are pretty old, um, but the research we've been doing uh, is ongoing and keeps things current and fresh, like the um, 2020 uh, version there. Um, so there's old things, there's the canon, there's new things, but it's not really a new thing for engaged learners and teachers. The MELD articulates what good teachers or researchers or other forms of learners already do. Um, so often people can say, hang on, I'm already doing that. And that's perfect. Um, or sometimes people say, um, actually, I've realized now that I'm missing out on some vital element that I haven't really thought about much and I can build that into my practice. But either way, no is a way to explicitly articulate what you're engaging in or what you would like students to engage in. And it's not always about making things explicit every time. And sometimes we need to. We have to uh, make professional judgment about when to make things more explicit. Now, in terms of facets, you'll see on the left, one of the early versions um, and an ongoing and enduring version, um, a framework mentioned, Research School Development Framework, <coughs> had linear facets. And we tried to um, have these arrows, these elliptical arrows, and represent this is not uh, linear, but we, we had problems with that articulation. But there was reasons why it also was um, very, very helpful. So I'm going to go through a uh, different format to show you these six facets. What's important here is that we identified from that literature I mentioned an ongoing use, six different <coughs> facets of sophisticated thinking, of engaged learning. Now, we're using the word facet like you do a jewel. That there's different sides, different faces that sparkle and shine for sophisticated thinking. And you can't easily take one off <coughs> when you're cutting a jewel. Uh, it doesn't, facets don't work like that. And which one do you look at? Where well, you can turn it in different angles and see different sparkles and shines. And so it is with the beauty of engaged learning, of this sophisticated thinking, that um, it's, it's multifaceted, is the way I'd like to think about it. So it's not at all hierarchical. Um, we drew on Bloom's taxonomy, but did not feed into the hierarchical sense of it because that did not help articulate the sophisticated thinking we wanted, which, as you'll see in a second, is very non-sequential, non-linear. But we started here. And the reason I'm showing you this version is because um, that was one stream, the facets. The other stream was the um, student autonomy, or I prefer to say now it's, uh, learning autonomy. And the learning autonomy is uh, represented um, in this version by, you could say, three levels. The first one where students emulate, and red here is not a uh, red flag danger, but is, the, say, the red end of uh, a rainbow spectrum. So one end of a, a spectrum of possibilities of autonomy, of learning autonomy. And students here, if they're emulating the teachers, the teachers are modelling as a very important area, and it's not an area to do and move away from. It's often an area to do, move away from, and come back to. So you'll you'll see me say several times in this presentation that uh, there's actually uh, a very um, dynamic movement, not only between the facets, but also across the levels of autonomy. So you don't become an increasingly autonomous, autonomous learner, but uh, in certain contexts, you can employ more or less autonomy. So the second level here is where students improvise. So they take the parameters and they run within those. Like a jazz musician's got a score and uh, improvises within it. Like builders have to a certain task for their building things and then there's a problem and they have to improvise within that. Um, and then the top level, is where students drive, um, they initiate things. But they drive the research question, the methodology, the, the literature they're drawing on. It's all around um, their own drive. 
And so simply put, um, those are, that's a give you some beginning sense of autonomy. So as I said, I'd like to um, run through the, uh, the facets of autonomy in a different configuration. I showed you a linear version, and now I'm going to show you a version that's very influential as um, this configuration was developed by students. So there's second, third, and fourth year mechanical engineering students developing um, some teaching and learning resources for a large first year communications and graphics design course. And they developed a version that I'll show you later, but its shape was this pentagon within a pentagon. And it has been such a helpful non-sequential, non-linear version is the one I prefer to use to unpack the facets because it looks a bit more like a jewel anyway. Um, so towards the end of um, this, I'm going to ask you to do something specifically um, to make your own context specific interpretation of one of these facets. It'll be the, the central one. So I'll just fly through these quickly because um, most of these, they're non-controversial. They're, they're things that people do. They don't use this terminology. You might not use this terminology. That's fine. But they're recognisable. And, of course, one idea with Melt is, um, and one thing we'll do in the workshop, is you'll need to be starting to adapt these to use the terminology that's more suited to your context, more comfortable for your students. But one of the facets is that we have to find information that's relevant uh, in, in a whole diversity of contexts where we may be problem solving, clinical re reasoning. So in problem solving, um, you, need, you might need to find information about uh, the width of a span. You might need to um, uh, generate um, data by speaking to um, clients in a clinical context, customers, uh, patients and uh, finding out, uh, taking a history and finding information. In a uh, kind of research context, you might be um, establishing methodologies to determine how to um, capture the volume of, of liquids or the pH of a, of a, of a liquid, for example. But the, the central thing that's common to all is we have to decide what will we use? What is it that um, exists what is it that we'll need to, to produce and then we need to use that? We have to evaluate whatever exists and whatever we produce and reflect on the overarching process. So these are things that, um, as one reviewer of our project said, this is the queen of facets because it's something that happens all the time and is one of the big reasons why we can't have a linear process or linear looking process, because everything's evaluated and we need to reflect ongoingly on the process. And so the question becomes, or it is, what should we trust? And well, I think we're almost in a post fake news era. I think we've moved on from fake news into, well, my university, for example, uh, sent out a fake scam to us to test us. <laughs> I'm not sure if your universities are doing that in Ireland, but it was <laughs> it should have been a scam, but it wasn't a scam. It was a fake scam. So what do you call that? So that and they of course that was a stupid thing to do because it actually really undermines the trust in the university administration and IT. Um, and we're always trying to be more discerning so we don't get uh, burrowing worms or Trojans into our IT systems. But for our students and for us, um, how critical is it in this information age that we not be gullible consumers of others' information, but um, be discerning users? And of course, applying the same standards to anything that we generate. We have to organise things in discipline and appropriate ways. Do we use prose um, because it's qualitative research? Do we um, write stories? Do we kind of write essays? Do we write uh, what's the structure of reports? Do we have quantitative data and how do we arrange graphs and tables? Um, is it um, line graphs? 
or is it discontinuous biogas? Because in some contexts, they're kind of almost illegal in some disciplines. You get laughed at. Um, how do we manage teams and time and processes? And this is the boring facet in terms of people uh, learning it. It's under-taught, underdeveloped, under-assessed. And, of course, it's an enabling facet that actually uh, allows people to have high levels of engagement if, if this goes well and they're setting themselves up. So the central question is how do we arrange uh, information, data, people, stuff. But this all sets us up to do the real work, we might even say, the real high-level stuff we're after for our students and ourselves in our writing and our research and our thinking, our teaching, analyze. And that is what I call the Jekyll and Hyde word. It's so complex. It doesn't need any other adjectives to make it more complex. <clears throat> Analysis has got that double whammy of the big picture and the fine detail. The big picture epitomized by uh, the trend, if it's um, quantitative and statistical, thinking about the, <clears throat> the, um, the trend in the data and uh, looking for outliers and all sorts of things like that. And then uh, if it's qualitative, uh, it's, it's about the themes. And what's the big picture of Hamlet? What's going on there? But at the same time, it's got a sense of pecking around in the detail and getting a fine look at what's going on. Well, what's the use of the article the in Hamlet? What's, um, what, what's the, um, um, the nature of that particular data point that is an outlier? Should it be excluded or included? Analysis is a very complex word. And then <clears throat> I've got here in construct, I often use um, synthesize, but that packaging together and all the different bits. And sometimes that's where we have an aha moment. I see what you mean. And sometimes... Um, it's a slow dawning process over uh, weeks, terms, or years, or semesters. So the central question there is, what does it mean? So what? Why do, did I just do that lab? Why did I just do that reading? Why did I do um, that kind of research or that learning? And it's a central question in education. Um, if, if our students can't really answer that question, um, know what's going on. And then on the outside, last but never least, it's often actually uh, first in reality, is communicate and apply. <clears throat> often the first thing we do is to communicate and to put it into action the things we've already, uh, knowledge and understanding and skills we already have. So we do mark a lot of communication products in education. So we tend to think of it as the end on thing, but these are processes, these are learning processes and <clears throat> communicate and apply is an integral part of that. And so um, often what we're trying to do really in, in education is to look for the evidence of the process in the product. So here, the emphasis on um, communicate uh, on processes, the question is how do we relate? How do we relate each other orally, body language, uh, eye contact like Dana and Carlos, um, how do we um, communicate in um, um, web medium, multimedia, or just word, um, word processing documents? Apply don't know now to the to this context into the future. So um, these are familiar things. Um, you might use different terminology, and that's a good thing. But you'll kind of see resonance with that. Now. The, the students created this brilliant motto, when in doubt, go to the centre. The centre is a point of clarity. The centre is knowing what is this thing that I'm doing? What is this learning I'm engaging in? Um, whether, like I said, it's a lab or it's a clinical context or work integrated learning context or a regular university assignment of different types. What's going on here? Now, the thing is that the similarities across the contexts are often in disguise. So here's Dana 
disguising itself to look like, I don't know, a ringmaster of a circus or something like that. Um, you can probably still recognize that. Um, the centerpiece um, is the thing that's always phrased differently. In fact, the way we've phrased it in MELT is unconditionally it has to be modified. The verbs cannot be used as they are. The other ones can be if you want to be or change, but these ones you can't really use the main verb. It, it don't, doesn't make enough sense to students, but it's to capture the diversity of what's going on in here, but mainly capture the, the commonalities. So the question is, what is our purpose? What, what um, are we doing? And the verbs we use is embark and clarify. So to, to embark is to, um, to set off on a journey. And in education, journeys are perilous, they're dangerous, because we're going into a place we've never been before. And you can contrast that with much of health um, and medicine, where people are frequently returning back to a health they knew in the past. And they want to, they want to feel younger, they want to feel well, they want to feel be um, <coughs> disease free, they want to be COVID free. I want to breathe again. But in education, learning is not like that at all. If we're learning, we've never been there. And as teachers, we've got the hard job of helping students to get a, a, a dim sense of where they can go and where they are going. And so to embark and clarify is a very difficult uh, enterprise. So this is the very thing I'm going to ask you to engage with before we do this, uh, finish this um, seminar. So ultimately, the big picture um, from here until um, at least two thirds away into the workshop is we're going to get you to adapt the melt, that which I just showed you, to a context you're involved in. Although reality is that it'll be in a team of, uh, say, four people, you will um, work focus in on one person's context. So you can have a good conversation about it and learn about the modification, the ad adapting process. Um, and then one person will have uh, the beginnings of, of melt with their own. So to begin to work towards that, I'm going to ask you to think about the central facet from your own teaching and learning perspective first. And so you know that's intentionally general, embark and clarify. But I'm going to show you some ways that others have phrased how students do that in a range of learning contexts. So people say things like ask or ask and clarify, ask questions, define problem, clarify need, determine aim, specify project, hypothesize, question, critique, determine topic, frame a question or frame a problem or frame a need, um, or they might just convert it into a question. What is my question? What is my goal? So um, these, these are just some examples of uh, the way people uh, in effect, asking students to launch out. Now, remember um, those six facets. Um, there's no one starting point. So often you start with communicate and apply and start to think, well, what do I already know? And I talk with someone, um, or self-talk. And um, But we have to become clear about purpose eventually. Now, I think that's often the hardest thing to do. So we know it is for PhD students. With it's often true for masters. It's often true in undergraduate first semester assignments. What a, what a, what's my purpose here? So this is a difficult thing. When we're, as teachers, those involved in teaching, we're trying to impart this sense of purpose in everything we do, every learning task, every assignment, every online element. Um, we're trying to impart a sense of purpose, but it's not easy. And so what I'm going to ask you to do uh, thinking about this terminology, is how do you ask students to embark in a specific context? So I'll encourage you to use a strong verb. So I had a number of strong verbs um, back there. And you, um, Tina, I wonder, I put in the, um, oh, that's okay, I'll do an ad. 
for uh, accessing this uh, PDF of this PowerPoint if you haven't done that yet. I'll do that uh, at the end of this slide, Dina. It's okay. Um, but I'm going to get you to um, use a strong verb like question, hypothesize, a determine, or frame, um, if possible. But you might um, choose a short phrase um, if you prefer, but keep it under 20 characters in the um, form we're using. So it's answer garden. Now, um, what I'm going to do is get out a um, PowerPoint and um, drop this into um, the text chat to give make it easy for you. And I'll also make sure that in text chat that you can access the PDF for this presentation, which is in a, a WordPress blog. Um, so I'm not sure if everyone's been able to access that. So I'll drop those two things into text chat and then I'll, I'll be quiet and give you a chance to think for a couple of minutes. So I'll give you um, two or three minutes to think what verb or verbs would you use when you're really prompting students to embark in this way in sophisticated learning, you could say. And you've um, seen those example verbs. Um, if you've got, um, once you've entered one thing, hit enter and you can put in several others into Answer Garden. But uh, in the meantime, I will stop sharing. Well, actually, no, I can probably, I can keep sharing and um, just go on to um, the ooh, text chat and drop this into text chat. There it is. So if you don't have that PDF, you can just go, oh, thanks, Steve. I just saw you did it. <laughs> cool. Thank you. Um, I'll also drop in the, um, the PowerPoint, sorry, what is it, the um, PDF of uh, the link to the WordPress, in case you haven't seen this, and uh, then you can get this PowerPoint in the PDF version, yeah, just in case you haven't got that. And there's, there's a few other things you'll need to get access from that. So, I right, will be quiet for a few minutes and let you think about verbs that you'll use in your context that really drive the students, that give that sense of purpose of the example that you And so after two or three minutes, we'll see how everyone's going. Mm. A nice answer already come up, thinking time. I like that. I haven't seen that uh, phrase that way before. It's really cool. Yeah, puzzle it out. Beautiful. And of course, there's that kind of nice um, puzzle based learning movement as well, but that more generally to be puzzled. And uh, I like the phrasing of puzzle it out. Reflect critically. Yep. Beautiful. Um, that kind of, and I think, um, what should we say? The drive for critical thinking is no doubt uh, is big uh, internationally. And I think uh, increasingly common is the phrase critical and creative thinking. And um, what are we doing when we're engaging in critical thinking? Um, so, and you might have at the very centerpiece of some disciplines, uh, and not all by any means, is that that absolute need to uh, to be to be a critical thinker. Um, so that's a that's a great driver. Oh, wow. Ah, oh, gravel. I love gravel. <laughs> I had come um, into trouble with gravel because I overused it with um, second year science education students. And 
they in my course evaluations I drew cartoons that represented like a teacher speaking and students with speech and thought bubble and one row of students because it was still done in paper in those days um, all filled in grapple in my speech bubble uh, because because I was so intoxicated by the power of the word that sense of I'm trying to get hold of it I can't you know, I, I can't quite hang on to it. I think it's a beautiful word. Just don't overuse it. But this is the absolutely fantastic. No one said that one here before. I hadn't even thought of it here. It's beautiful. Validate. Oh, that's a very powerful verb, isn't it? And depending on your purpose, like your course purpose, your disciplinary purpose, um, that that's very provocative um, as a punchy starter. <laughs> Amazing, actually. Uh, summarize. Well, some of us, it's summarised headlines, okay? And that's a much more uh, specific and tangible thing. And that raises up um, an issue of how general or how specific, if you contrast grapple with summarised headlines, grapple's very general and summarised headlines are much more targeted. And, of course, you're making those decisions. You're kind of melt. You cannot use Embark fairly. You know, it's just too vague. Um, but you get the sense of it. You, you kind of professionally engage with it and you do this. This is exactly why the kind of accidental acronym of, you know, being a verb melt um, was so beautiful because this warmth, I know it's a sterile online environment, but for me there's a certain warmth of interaction here just by reading your beautiful verbs. I can see what, where you're going. I can see where your mind is in these simple, powerful verbs. That, that warmth of conversation makes milk fluid for me and hopefully for you too. And you can see that it takes on its own life force um, because you imbue it with life, because you're the teaching personality and the one with the professional judgment to know what the students need and what the disciplinary context demands. And those things... Um, come together. So that's absolutely fantastic. <laughs> so now that sets us up beautifully. I think, um, Dino, I'm right to say we're just hit time for the end of this um, introductory seminar. Is that correct? Yeah, we're fit. We, yeah, we can, we're, we want, we're scheduled to take a 10 minute break, comfort break. Yep. Yep. And so, Mike's going to put us into groups. Well, yeah, after the break. So we're going to have the yep. break. Um, in the PowerPoint you can access, you can see a lot of um, worked examples, uh, especially one um, from uh, <coughs> um, mechanical engineering where the tutors developed the Pentagon version. But um, what we'll do is let's stick to the time frame, Dina, yeah. and um, think people can think about questions that they have because the first breakout is going to happen after about three minutes of the workshop. And I'm going to ask you to talk together with your breakout group about um, some of the, you'll formulate some questions in that. So it'll give you a chance to actually talk with others and uh, think about. So I reckon let's stick to the time frame. Now okay. in in Ireland, I guess it's five minutes to ten. Ten. Five to ten. Yep. So we meet back at five past ten. Okay. Yeah. And then people, you'll have a chance to give a cup of tea to start to formulate some questions. And the, one of the things I'm going to ask you first in the workshop, I might as well tell people, Dina, um, in the actual workshop, what I'll ask you is to do this. Um, what's one feature of MELT that has caught your attention? And what's one feature of MELT that may be problematic? Now, you can, um, you, you can answer more than that. And you might have, uh, as a group, um, further questions that you would ask me. But they're the two things that I, I was interested in you reporting back in the first breakout, just to give you a heads up. So um, thank you very much for your valuable contributions, because they were, like, really striking, Dina. I really like them. So I'll look forward to uh, meeting you back at um, five past your 10 o'clock. Okay. Okay, that, thank you very much, John.